Hello. Um, so I've really always been a feminist. Um, even in times when I didn't embrace that word, I still believed in feminism very deeply since I was very, very little. Um, I have a, I need you to slide over here in the way. There we go. Um, somewhere in my basement, there's a letter to my father that I wrote maybe when I was five. I was trying to find it so I could put a copy up here for you. But basically the letter was like, write as I learned to write. And I wrote a letter to my father Dear Daddy, it's not fair that you treat Brian better than me just because he's a boy. <laughs> Love, Jennifer. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, my parents were very uh, consciously on the conscious side. They were very much about making sure that they treated all their children equally and not be biased based on any, any sort of stereotype. They would say that to us all the time. But clear, clearly things sort of snuck in Anyway, yeah. so, and you know, why? Why was I so strong? Why was I so outspoken about wanting to be treated the same? Um, it may have been in part because of some of the women in my life. This is my great, great aunt, my grandmother's aunt. She, um, in this photo, she's 45 years old. She, this, is, and this photo is from 1938. Uh, and she was a lawyer in Washington, D.C. as a career. She never married. She was a career lawyer the whole time. Um, and this is a photo of her in, oh, come on. In uh, 1983, at her 90th birthday party. Um, and she influenced my grandmother quite a lot. My grandmother was also a career woman at a time when women, uh, or I should say middle class women, typically didn't have careers. Um, and also was a government worker. Yeah, I was always, we were, my family was a carpentry family. We were a construction worker family. And so I learned to spackle when I was really little, like before I learned how to use a toilet. Um, <laughs> I was really into building stuff, like these blocks. Um, I just, I just did. I mean, I think this is, you know, whatever maybe is genetic, I, I had this, right? So there we are, another one of our block creations. Um, so these are pictures of just me in my childhood in the 70s. I mean, this is pretty typical of what a kid could be in the 70s. Um, both a tomboy and not a freely girl, but you know, hey, why not throw in a tutu? Um, fish we were catching. These are the biggest fish I ever caught in my life. I'm on the, I'm on the wet left, my brother and sister. Um, and this picture got a lot of attention the last year. You know, especially in stark contrast to, this, to the current ads that Lego puts out and all the Lego girl kits and stuff. Um, she's super cute. There's also these kids, too. They, I don't know, their pictures are not getting tweeted at the same rate. <laughs> um, but somehow we went from that to this. And we now live in a world where, like, this is the norm. And we, I think we have this idea that sort of society is always getting better we're always getting better around gender. We're always getting better around race. You know, racism is almost over. Uh, everything is getting better and better. And it's like, well, just in my own lifetime, my own experience, like, I, I, this, I didn't have this when I was a kid. Um, this, uh, this one I love, this girl in the middle, this is a, still a video of a girl, little girl. She's on YouTube and she's like, what is going on? This is so wrong. What? <laughs> I mean, this is kind of the contrast between the types of toys and catalogs when I was a kid and then the types of toys and catalogs that we have now. And, this, and the really harsh roles and expectations around gender, both for girls and for boys. It squishes both genders into these little tiny boxes. And then we've got these brands and these you know, things that are like the girl toys and the boy toys. The girl is, can be a nurse, the boys can be doctors. Um, and the girl nurses have pink stuff and the boy doctors have blue stuff. There's no pink in this photo. <laughs> um, and I was playing with dolls who seemed to have died or something. <laughs> <laughs> and blocks and empty potato chip cans because they were kind of cool too. Um, it all mixed together, right? This would have driven me insane. This is a, an aisle of, of power tool or, or hand tools that are pink. I had a set of hand tools. I had my own toolbox. It was all real tools. I think it probably was maybe seven or eight or maybe nine. And my brother had his own box. My 
father went to Sears and he bought a full set of screwdrivers for each of us, a full set of hammers, wrenches, everything. And my mother like put this jelly text of our names onto each of the tools. So we knew that this is Jennifer's hammer and this is Brian's hammer. Um, I didn't have pink tools. Um, so this really, let me talk more about tech, right? Okay, let's follow my life through tech. Um, when did tech come into my life? I think probably with Pong that we picked up at a yard sale. And it was amazing because you could actually attach this machine to the television and you could change what was on the television. It wasn't from coming from the broadcast towers. It was coming from me. Like, oh my god. And we got an Atari, Atari 2600. Um, some nerd nostalgia here. Uh, and then in middle school, the math class bought four computers, the math department, very big deal. They were on carts, two computers, and they would put two computers in one class and two computers in the other, and you'd have them for like two weeks, and then they'd like roll them to the other classes. Um, and so I learned basic on the Atari 400. Uh, also around that time I was playing D&D, &D, right? It was just a normal part of life. Um, my brother also really loved it. We drew all kinds of extensive maps and plans and monsters and everything. But we, it's really more fun if you play with more than two people. Having one dungeon master and one player doesn't really work. <laughs> so we would get my brother's friends. Now he's you know, three years younger than me and his friends, it was cool. But then they got to be a certain age and they started being like real assholes. And that, you know, teenage, young, preteen asshole. Like one of his friends burned down the woods and almost went to jail because the fire department had to come out and like put out the woods on fire. So that didn't last very long. But meanwhile, also my father, he, he, my father was an architect, a uh, draftsman when I was little and later an architect. And, and this is not, I should have scanned a drawing of my own, but this is what I just grabbed off the internet this morning. But we would, for fun, like hang out and draw our dream houses to scale <laughs> and draft them on my father's drafting table when he wasn't looking so we wouldn't get in trouble. Um, but this is just, you know, it's like stuff we did as kids. Um, and, and also in this time, there was this moment that I, I fear many people don't know about. But in the 80s, especially in the early 80s, where gender really started to dissolve. And like in middle school, on the bus, the boys would be like putting on mascara and eyeshadow because it was cool. It was fun, it was freely, it was like whatever, just people do whatever. I mean, this is David Bowie and Annie Lennox. Like, which one is the male and which one is the female? It's, it was very, if you wanted to sort of shave the side of your head and dye the rest of your hair green and spike it three feet above your head and go to school, like, that's fine, that's cool. Like, it was just a lot of freedom and a lot of ability to play around that we, um, I mean, even just going to the restroom in this building. The women's restroom is marked with a high heel and the men's restroom is marked with a mustache. If I think about the first decade of my adult life, sort of one I, once I started to have a career, that first decade, I knew far more men who wear high heels than I knew women who wore high heels, literally. Okay, so, so that's against the rules if you want to work here. You're supposed to, you know? And then men, I mean, some men have amazing mustaches, but there are plenty of men who don't and can't. Like, you have to be of a certain ethnicity from a certain region of the world to grow these giant, twisty mustaches. Like, what if you're Asian? What if you're black? What if you're Latino with more of an indigenous heritage? Like, oh, then you're not really a real man because real men participate, or I should say, real people who are cool in the tech industry participate in Movember. And if you're not in Movember, then you're, like, not one of us. Like, it just, I don't know, like, how did we get from this world where we were really sort of breaking everything open into a world where the boxes just seemed to get, get tighter and tighter and tighter. Um, and I think a lot of this went away very quickly, at least like the makeup among very straight boys uh, when AIDS hit. It was just like homophobia just sort of stamped out all of that. Um, I also took shop as a seventh grader. Um, these are photos sort of before I took shop, <laughs> after I took shop. Um, but I feel like that shop class was sort of my first experience of get the fuck off. Where I was spackling before I was out of diapers. I already knew half the stuff we learned in shop class. But the, I was the only girl in shop class because you were supposed to either take home economics or shop in that slot. And I was like, ugh, oh, cooking. Uh, I'm taking shop. Uh, 
but the boys were very, especially some of them, were very adversarial that I was there. And they would make really crude jokes and really ostracize me and really try to get me to not be there. And so for eighth grade, I didn't take shop. I, it was metal shop, it would have been kind of awesome, but I, I didn't do it. Um, and, and I think that, that that impulse, that sort of feeling, that GTFO, get the fuck off, is, is something that we need to be talking about a lot, that's very, very common. And sometimes it's subtle and sometimes it's very overt, but it's, it's definitely present. Um, then uh, after eighth grade, I went to engineering camp. Um, this was the brochure. I think it's interesting. There was another paper I was trying to find as well that I didn't, that had like a lot of pictures of girls in it. Um, this was the schedule. Basically in the morning we were doing computer programming, I think it was Fortran, and in the afternoon we were engineering toothpick bridges. That got load tested at the end of the week. They put it into this machine, and it you know, had to be a certain size, and then they'd start applying pressure to the top of the bridge and see when it would break, and they would measure how much force. Uh, this is me and my lab partner and the bridge that we built. And this is the trophy that sits above my desk because we won first place. <laughs> <laughs> I pulled it out, I, I think sometime last year when I was feeling especially angry about the state of being a woman in tech, I was like, I'm pulling out my fucking trophies. <laughs> My engineering camp trophy. These are the teachers from engineering camp, 1983. There are one, two, three, four, five women, four men, one, two, three, at least three, maybe four people of color. Like it was diverse, it was mixed. So how did we get from that to where we are now? In fact, if you pull up stats, you can see these trends on the graphs where things there were more and more women involved, and then there were less and less. There's more and more diversity, and then less and less. Um, I mean, as we saw the film at the beginning of the night, it was women who invented computer programming in the first place, and then all the women got shoved out when the men came home from war. Like, it's just a uh, random image uh, visiting AT&T headquarters in Northern Virginia, video teleconferencing. This is like a fax printout of the video teleconferencing <laughs> <laughs> session. And I don't know who we were video teleconferencing with, but anyway, I thought I'd throw it in. Um, and this is, a, the bottom is part of my application to engineering camp, and the top is like the results of some sort of standardized test that I took in middle school um, or early high school. And, and I, I, I find it interesting because I'm sort of like, hey, I really love math and problem solving, but I also really like art. And so I'm thinking that you know architecture might be a good match. Or at the top, the the, the computer results are telling me uh, your first choice of career goals is in the group called visual and performing arts. Um, the question is, would you enjoy this type of work? <laughs> <laughs> your favorite school subjects and activities do not reflect this. Do not not match this choice. Furthermore, you are planning education that's usually more you know more education than usually. Basically, they're saying you're not going to make as much money in this area. Um, you might, briefly, you might find other kinds of work more interesting and challenging. And then, the, oh, you indicated that your second choice was engineering and applied science. This is a great match for you. This is what you should do, blah, blah, blah. It's just very, it's funny. Like, this is my whole entire career is going back and forth between art and, and tech, art and tech, art and tech. Um, senior year of high school, I did the same engineering. I was, I totally forgot until I was pulling stuff for this presentation. Um, I was in a group group at school that went to like engineering competitions. So we did another engineering, another toothpick bridge contest. Again, went down, and this time we only, we only got fifth place because we weren't, we weren't cheating. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, later in high school, everybody was like buying extra glue on the side. And, uh. But then in um, high school, I started, I took computer programming in high school. There were only two classes. I took both of them. Um, so I took AP Computer Science as a, as a junior. Uh, there were like 15 students in the class, maybe two girls in the class. And it was sort of like me and this guy, whose name I don't remember, but the two of us would race. Mondays we would get, the teacher would like teach us the, the concepts. And then Tuesdays we would get the assignment. And you had from Tuesday to Friday to program 
the, um, the, do the program. And the classroom didn't have any computers in it, so you would go to the computer lab and use the computer lab. And when you were done with your program for the week, you would go back to the classroom. And so this one guy and I would race to see who could finish the program fastest. And we usually finished on Tuesday, but sometimes on Wednesday. And then we had like the rest of the week, Thursday, Friday, to sort of hang out. And no one else was in the room. <laughs> so we would get into all kinds of trouble. Um, and there was one other guy who would show up really quick, too. So it was usually the three of us hanging out. And I feel like that was the beginning of my introduction to get culture and my introduction to, like, additional sexual harassment and, like, sophomoric, you know, this is how you're supposed to act. Um, then when I got to college, I had a chance to take computer science. Uh, we w I would have been programming on a machine a lot like this, on a VAX machine. Um, but I decided not to take it. It just was, like, these little things of sort of not fitting with the culture and sort of like, this is how you're supposed to act. And if you get into this field, you have to deal with this kind of behavior. You have to deal with these kinds of comments. You have to deal with this kind of, I had a lot of interest. There were a lot of options. I took calculus just for fun, but uh, I didn't take computer programming. And much later that really bit me, you know, because I could have known the command line and I didn't. I could have known C basically and I didn't. Um, today it would be easy, to, much easier to pick up JavaScript or Objective-C or whatever if I had had you know. But instead, I ended up getting a Mac SE, and again, the sort of art, and it was great. I, I, it was a big decision um, to get this because it didn't have a command line on it. But uh, it turned me into a graphic designer um, and a computer expert because the next year after I got mine, the whole school had them, and I knew how to use mine because I'd had mine like four months longer than everybody else. Um, uh, Super Paint. Anybody remember Super Paint? Super Paint was awesome. And I loved it because I could draw and erase. Because I always wanted to draw, but I was very critical and always very unhappy with what I did, and I would try to erase things, and it wouldn't erase, and the paper would get all screwed up, and the watercolor it would just get awful. But with super paint, it didn't matter. You could erase 100 million times, and it still looked awesome. Um, and I got into theater in college, and then I went into theater professionally, and I basically worked in the arts for a long time. Um, a lot of the, all the jobs I had in theater were like deckhand, wardrobe, like dresser, changing people's clothes, um, running props, working as a carpenter, working as an electrician. And I had all this experience as a carpenter and I could pick up the electrician stuff really quick. And in theater, there really it wasn't a big deal for there to be women and men. It was just sort of all mixed. And I knew I couldn't really climb the ladder into union, the union theaters because I knew I was never ever gonna get into the union. But at least starting out, it was really easy to, um, until I had to go to the lumber yard, you know? Because like I go to the lumber yard and I'd be like, I have a list of what I need. In today's dollars, it's like five grand of lumber, but I can't get anybody to wait on me. Like I'm walking around and they're ignoring me and I'm like, I'm about to drop five grand in your face. Like you don't, it's really frustrating. Or at one time uh, I was working in a theater and we were working insanely long hours and um, I was running a, a circular saw cutting up sauna tubing, which is like a very heavy duty cardboard tube, exhausted. And this volunteer showed up and he's like, hey, can I help? And we're like, yes, please, what do you, let's put you to work. And he walked in the back of the shop and he saw me with a circular saw and he came over and he was like, oh my God, you're gonna hurt yourself. And he grabs the circular saw while it's spinning and pulls it. And I'm like, dude, I know I don't have a penis, but you know what, I actually know that that's really dangerous. <laughs> like, like, don't, you know, it just, and it's just these little instances that I think many of us have experienced time after time after time that maybe in the moment it wasn't a huge big deal, but when you add them up over and over and over and over, it actually becomes a really big deal. Um, and I, then I worked at a nonprofit for a long time, nonprofit arts administration, and, and uh, did all the graphic design for, it basically did all the stage managing, all the technical direction, all the theater design, all the graphic design, bookkeeping. Ugh. And then when we needed a website, I was the webmaster. Like, of course I'm going to do that because I know how to use the computers and the graphics and the Photoshop and the... Um, so I learned from this book, mostly. Like, really... You know, it was easier then. It was much, 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 much easier. Um, but I think, I think many of us who were ever, you know, you skirt in and out of these sort of spaces where you're not supposed to be and you, you start to learn these workarounds. So I remember like one workaround I had because I would buy a lot of all the computer equipment. I was like the IT person for the nonprofit. We didn't buy that much stuff, but every once in a while we had a little bit of budget and we could like buy something. So I would, because this is really before the web had a lot of information, I'd like Mac Mall, Mac Warehouse, Mac Connection catalogs. 
and I sort of know half of what I needed to know to make a good order, but then I didn't know the rest. So I would call up any one of them on the 1-800 toll-free number, and I would ask them a question that I totally knew the answer to that was kind of complicated, and I would just see what answer I got, and if it was total bullshit, I'd be like, thanks so much, and I'd hang up the phone, and I'd redial, because you could just get a different random person. And it was always men, and they, sometimes I was talked to like, hey, you're a really great customer, and oh, you actually know what you're talking about, I can tell. Because you know, they get a zillion people calling them on the phone, especially even more so today, who really have no idea what they're talking about. So I get that. They start there. But um, sometimes I get somebody who would immediately realize that, like, oh, I gotta take it up a notch, and we can have a real conversation, they would tell me real answers. Lots of times, they, and they needed to elevate me to somebody else, right? But lots of times, they would just totally try to snow me. I'd be like, click. And I felt like it was like those kinds of workarounds to, um, to sort of operate as a woman in tech. Um, but then, I don't know, I went to film school and then I decided I wanted to move to New York City and then I didn't have enough money and I couldn't pay my rent in a very short, that's a short story. So I started getting deeper and deeper into tech and taking, I ended up working at the New York Stock Exchange for a while. Um, and I had done a lot of freelance, not freelance, a lot of like small business web design, like I would be the web designer and web developer for a lot of small sites, for a lot of different people, a lot of folks that I knew in the nonprofit world, or artists, or people who needed websites. Um, and, and I started, but in New York City, I couldn't really make a living off of that. So I started getting bigger projects and switching over to Drupal, and, and then I regretted not knowing the command line. And then I, I was like slowly getting deeper and deeper into some really hardcore heavy duty stuff. To build a Drupal website, your skills, you need you know, more skills than I've had before. So um, it was great. Drupal community is really open, open source, you know, all these opportunities, especially in New York, to go to meetups and learn things and amazing people and very generous people. Um, but then there was, there was this one, you know, situation where like there were these couple guys who were acting just like these other guys I had known in middle school and they were like, <laughs> it's raining outside, girls make sure you wear white t-shirts to the meetup tonight. <laughs> and I would say things like, come on, can you like not, like I'm, I work at the New York Stock Exchange. I'm trying to convince everybody around to like get into this IRC chat room, and you guys are acting like this in here. Like, could you please take that somewhere else? And they'd always be like, "Well, we run the group, and you can't." Blah, blah, blah. So, like, so I finally was like, "Fine, whatever. I'm just gonna ignore it." But then at one point, somebody else, a man, actually did something to sort of dethrone them, change the power dynamics, and get that behavior banned and made not allowed. And they blamed me, and so they came after me. Um, and, th and the threats that I got were so specific and so violent, and they were from people that I knew who lived in my town. And, and I went to the police, and they were like, yeah, this is a felony. This is called uh, what is it, aggravated threats, um, in part because of the specificity and the extremity of the language, and in part because they were targeting me because I was a woman, and lesbian or bi uh, in there. Uh, they, they were like, yeah, this is a felony. And I didn't go to the FBI, I think today I would. Uh, luckily, they didn't dox me, but it was that kind of, it was the beginning of that kind of stuff that we've seen a lot with Gamergate. And I felt like, uh, it was surprising, because Kathy Sierra had been threatened, and I had watched her go underground, and I had sort of thought from the sidelines, like, wow, that's a very extreme response, like why are you hiding out? Why are you ending your career? You're Kathy Sierra, Kathy Sierra is amazing. You keynote South by Southwest, like you stand on stage in front of 3,000 people. Why would you shut your career down over some guys who are threatening you when you know they're probably like joking, right? And then when it happened to me on a much tinier level, I mean much, much tinier level, I was like, I am out of here. I don't care. I don't want to get raped. I don't want to have to worry if one of these guys, these three guys, is like actually mentally unstable and is the kind of guy who would act on these threats. Like, the chances went from absolutely zero to, I don't know what, like one half of 1%, 1%. Like that was already, that's too many percents. <laughs> And, and I, because I worked at NYSE at the time at the stock exchange, I was behind Homeland level securities. I had to literally go past two security, go through two security checkpoints, past a police tank, and a set of dogs, and a dude with a machine gun to get to the office. And I hated that until I had been threatened. And then I was like, well, at least I don't have to worry while I'm at work. <laughs> like, at least they're not gonna be able to get into this building. So, um, 
And I just completely dropped out of the Drupal group. And in a way, actually, it wasn't even the threats that were the worst. It was the group's response to the threats that ended up being the biggest problem, where uh, several people in the group, several men, were very much like, this is completely unacceptable. Several people in the international community were like, this is completely unacceptable. But there were a lot of people who were like, well, we should mediate this conflict because we like having a happy group and our group isn't happy right now. So how about we all come together and we try to talk about the issues? And I'm like, what conflict? Like, I'm a woman. He's telling me to get the fuck out and threatening me to the level that the police consider a felony. And you want to like see, make sure we have equal time to just, you know, I, I don't know. So it was sort of after that when I realized that the group itself was just didn't know what to do and wasn't really sure. And there were even women in the group who kind of came after me. And later, that I, opinion of me followed me into some work I wanted to do around HTML5 and Drupal 8. And I ended up not being able to do that work. And I ended up, in a way, being asked to leave or told someone else was going to be in charge. Um, because of that, I, those ideas of like, oh, well, she's that bitch who can't get along with anybody. You know, it's not good to have her around. Um, and I, and I, I understood in a way better. Like, yeah, I would rather quit my career and switch yet again to another field because I've done that several times. So like, whatever, I'll just go do something else. Um, than to live under that sort of sense of fear or frustration or alienation or whatever. I mean, not that that's the worst thing that's ever happened to anybody. There's plenty of people around the world who deal with much more intense levels of crazy town and work their way through it because they don't have any time, any, like, op they don't have choices. I was very lucky to have choices. But, um, and I think it's hard, you know, when the leadership at the very, very top of Drupal is saying things from, like, a keynote stage, like, oh, you know, well, all the mothers need, you know, like, just weird sexist tropes. And then you call them on that after, and they're like, well, I'm not sexist, because there's no sexism in Europe. <laughs> and I'm European. <laughs> like, there's just this sort of sense of, of um, even sort of benign things, or things that might seem benign, or smaller failures can actually have really big impact, especially when they're added up with other things. And I, and I, I began to feel like, you know, if the leadership at the very top of some, some situation really doesn't want to do anything about the problems, then there's not. In a way, there's not a whole lot you can do, and that's where I feel like I just dodge and turn again. It's just sort of work around, figure out a way. And I ended up um, feeling like I went to an event apart, and I had an amazing time, and it was not 95% men, and the men were not uh, acting this way. And, and I was like, oh, I don't need to leave tech. I just need to switch the slice of tech. I just need to find my people. I just need to kind of go to some place where things are going to be more comfortable in a way. Um, so whatever, for all that. Um, but I feel like one of the trends that I'm seeing that's a little frustrating, I mean, the last year, there's been so much around violence, basically, against people in the tech community, around gender, around race. We're seeing sort of the, it's, it's been around for years and years and years. It's just been hidden. So I've been really, really happy that it's not being hidden so much anymore. Um, but some of a lot of the response has been, well, we need to have girls in tech programs. We need to get camps for girls. We need to tell women that math doesn't suck. And you know, the way to tell women or girls, the way to tell the girls that math doesn't suck is to use pink, because girls really like pink. Um, or you know, you should have like toys for girls and STEM toys for girls, and you should have like STEM events for girls and like pink, 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 pink. Like, why? This is a, a, another, like a toy that got started on Kickstarter. Really great, you know, earnest, important ideas. Like, let's get more girls interested in tech. But why is our one conclusion, oh, well, the reason that girls aren't in tech, the reason we don't have women in these industries is because girls aren't interested. And the reason that girls aren't interested is because it's not pink enough for them. <laughs> so what we should do is make it more pink. What I do like about this is the boys who are like, whatever, pink, that's cool, that's fine. Um, you know, like here's STEM girl workshops. Here's a few of the workshop stations. Strawberry DNA analysis, bubble gum, lip gloss for change. <laughs> Scratch the dancing cat. Like, I, I know. let's not just do this. Like, maybe we do a little bit of this, but let's not just do this. Um, Nicole Sullivan said a couple weeks ago, I really like this, focusing on the pipeline is super convenient, like that you can justify for another 20 years 
with no women executives. <laughs> like, you don't have to worry if you're just focusing on the 10-year-olds. You get 10 years or 15 years before you're worrying about women at, at age 25. You got 40 years to worry about women, you know. Um, yeah, get the fuck off. It's a big deal. It's a problem. We need to talk about it. Um, geez, wonder why women in tech keep getting harassed. So here's an article about uh, a woman who was talking on Twitter about experiencing sexual harassment in, at Google and her unhappiness with their response, sort of explaining what had happened. And then in the sidebar, you, know, you could say, oh, it's a good article. We're talking about these issues. Like, there's the ad <laughs> in the sidebar. Or, you know, this is just sort of low-level stuff. This happened to me the other day. I'm like, oh, yeah, a woman on Skype. You get these periodically. Hey, baby. <laughs> Noticed you have a vagina. <laughs> and you're on Skype. Want to hang out? <laughs> no. Um, yeah, or this is a big, I mean, this has happened to me. I don't want to go into the details, but this has happened to me many times where I've been fired. Uh, Danny Norton says, six weeks into every new gig for the past five years, I've been talked to about my tone. Um, yeah, like as I've gotten, because I used to be very, very shy and just super scared. And slowly over the course of my life, I've done an incredible amount of different things to not be in that fear, fearful state anymore. And um, especially at the stock exchange, surprisingly, there were some things that happened where, like, there, so there was a guy who was coding. I saw his code. I knew it was a problem. I didn't actually, wasn't an employee of the stock exchange. I was an employee of a shell company. And there were other employees of the shell company, and I had a boss at the shell company. So I went up the chain of command, and I talked to my boss and my boss's boss at the shell company, and I had a meeting with them, because they were also developers, and they were working on this project. And I said, hey, this guy's code is really a problem. I think we should really look at it. And I got in trouble. I got chastised, and they ignored me. So I sat on my hands, and I was like a good little girl, and I was like, okay, I can't lose this job. I gotta pay my rent. And then six weeks later, we launched, and the site was a complete failure. It, it, the page load time was like three minutes because his code was a pile of shit. And not only did my entire team from the shell company almost get fired, like not only did I almost get fired because our entire, the place that I worked for almost got fired. The people who I worked with at, because the, these people were all in California. I was in New York. Everybody in New York, the people in New York who I really liked, they almost all got fired. And I was so pissed. And so for the next six months, I was just like, I'm just gonna say whatever to anybody. And I don't care if you fire me, because you must fired me when I shut up, and so fine, fire me. I didn't want to work for NICE anyway. And the folks at NICE and the NICE leadership loved it. <laughs> I was so surprised. These like corporate guys who had never really worked around people like that before, and I was like, "Ooh, he's the corporate VP of I don't know what." Like, I just was like, "Well, you know, this thing is a piece of shit. We should fix it." And he was like, "God, I love her," <laughs> <laughs> because I would speak truth to them when other people wouldn't. Um, so, I I become more of that kind of person, and then that's gotten me in trouble because there are other companies that they're like, "Well, you know." We're a team, we work as team players here, and you're not enough of a team player. So I just don't think it's a good culture fit, and we're gonna let you go. And it's just so frustrating, because I know I'm not being an asshole. I know I'm just being honest and savvy, and I have a lot of experience, and I'm really smart, and I know what I'm talking about, and that doesn't go over well many times. It's very, people see that as very, a big problem, so anyway. Uh, I think this is interesting. Teetering on the brink of an epiphany, this pers first person tweeted, and they s tweeted a screenshot of a different tweet where someone, a Gamergate fan, was saying, my biggest problem with Anita, Anita Sarkeesian, who's been doing all this work talking about games and tech, that his biggest problem with her and her feminist analysis is that if I used her logic, I would see sexism everywhere. <laughs> like, almost, he almost, <laughs> he's almost... <laughs> Got it. <laughs> I know, it's so depressing. But we've got to talk about it. We just have to. And it's so much more exciting to talk about it, as depressing as it is, than to not talk about it.
because there are people who know these things go on. It's the same thing is true with racism. All of us white people need to be willing to talk about it and willing to listen because there's shit going on that people have been dealing with forever that needs to be talked about in a way that's very vulnerable and very honest and that is hard to do and can be very, very scary for some reason that we don't quite understand. Some reason that's like so deep that it's 300 years deep that's not even our fault in a way, but it's just so like hard, but we need to talk about these things. I think we need to notice in the moment as things are happening, when you see you know, something happening at work, when you see something happening to you or a coworker, when you see something happening on, on, twi on Twitter, I think in that moment, you know, it gets easy to talk about the big picture and, and, and the sexism or the, the, is the oppression in the big picture, but it doesn't actually happen in the big picture. It happens in little tiny moments. So if we're going to catch it or change it, it's going to get caught and changed in little tiny moments. Um, and to be proactive, you know, for people who are planning conferences, to look at the number of women, the number of people of color, the amount of diversity. For people who have podcasts, <laughs> To count the 85 guests and to constantly be like, I have way too many white men on my podcast. I need to have more other people on my podcast. Jen. Um, it's, it, it's like a constant amount of being proactive, constantly doing these things. Because we are fighting centuries of structures. It's not something we can do quick. Um, and, the, and the culture change. Like, I think... Uh, Things have changed. They have gotten better. If you watch Mad Men, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that person said that in that office. I'm so glad that we don't talk like that anymore. Like, the things have changed. Um, and they'll continue to change, but it really is on us to change. I mean, culture is changing no matter what we do. We talk about changing culture, like, I want to change the world, as if the world were going to stay static if you weren't trying to make it change. <laughs> Like, the world is going to change. The question is, how is it going to change? Is it going to get more pink and more stereotypical, or is it going to get less? Um, it really is up to us to... These little nudges. This happens in little nudges. Um, yeah, so those are my random thoughts. Thanks. This is my podcast, thewebahead.net. Check it out. <laughs>